got it recording. And this is our 34th lesson on the study of the biblical flood from my book. It, it's from the second edition of the book, which has not been printed yet. And I'm, re, I'm revising the book. I'm really not revising the content. I'm just adding material and a fair amount of new material to it. That, uh, solidifies some of my arguments, gives even new, some new arguments to help to see what happened during the flood of Genesis chapter six through nine. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna look at earthquakes and volcanoes, and uh, this is from chapter 10, and so it's less than 10. And we're looking at magnetic fields uh, as a linkage to the earthquakes, but there were probably a minor part of it. But we'll be looking at something else, magnetic fields as well, and other phenomena explained by magnetic fields. We'll be looking at that as well. There, I don't believe there were any antediluvian. That means anti, of course, is before, and it's from Latin word for before. Uh, anti is a Greek word. Ante is a that is a Latin word, antediluvian, before the flood, volcanoes or earthquakes recorded in the scriptures. So we don't have any evidence of either earthquakes or volcanoes occurring in the scriptures before the flood. So again, uh, what we're saying is that doesn't prove it didn't occur, but it does uh, say that if we have a model that, that doesn't ha have them occurring before the flood, that it wouldn't contradict the Bible. That's my point. That's why I point that out. Not to prove it didn't occur, but to say my model won't contradict what the Bible says. Volcanoes, we'll look at the ozone layer too, just a bit, when we look at it. Okay. Now, what planet was involved in causing the flood? I've already set forth that I'm convinced it was the planet Mercury. I think the evidence is pretty strong that it was. We're looking at the planet Mercury in this uh, chapter as we study this and see some evidence for the planet Mercury. And we'll be looking at the life of the Earth's magnetic field. We're looking at the magnetic field of the Earth. Magnetic field of the Earth shields us from harm, some harmful radiation, so it's a benefit to us, but the field is decreasing in intensity. And we ask the question, what causes the Earth's magnetic field? As far as I know from what physics I've taken, and most of my physics has been small particle physics. I uh, took uh, atomic nuclear physics and, and mostly other small particle physics. I haven't done a great amount of uh, graduate work in anything but small particle physics. My study was semiconductor physics, but uh, and graduate work in physics, but uh, I did some study in lasers. But uh, what causes the Earth's magnetic field? To my knowledge, there's only three kinds of, of sources that would create a magnetic field. There may be some things I don't know about, but uh, I just know of three that I can remember from what my studies. But we'll point those out if we get to them. James, if you know of anything else, you might throw it in for us and uh, as we get into this further. We want to ask the question, has the Earth's magnetic field reversed polarity? That's the claim it's made. And we'll look at the evidence for this and uh, we'll lay it out and discuss that as we go through this. Now then, we'll look at some problems with the field reversal theory in this series of studies as well. And what caused uh, the at least the what would I say is apparent reversal of the Earth's magnetic field? What caused this? If if it didn't really reverse, if it only appeared to be what caused the apparent reversal, the magnetic field of the Earth is not stationary. It's not sitting in one spot. It's moving around. It's wandering. And we we'll look at vulcan, volcanism, volcanism, uh, volcanoes, and the flood in this study. We'll also look, and not this one tonight, but we'll be looking in this series of this chapter about the oblateness of the Earth. Now, that's the fact that the Earth is not entirely a sphere. That is, it's, it has a greater diameter at the equator due to the spinning motion of the Earth. 
than it does at the poles, at the geographic poles, that is. We'll define oblateness and look at the oblateness of various planets and uh, see the causes of, of, of oblateness. Now then, I also am postulating, I think the evidence is clear that the Earth has slowed down in its rotation uh, and that the planet that caused the flood caused this to occur and the change in the length of the day, probably by a few minutes, perhaps as much as uh, 15 or 20 minutes of time. But we'll look at that as we get into the uh, proof of this evidence for it. So we will see the effects of the changes in oblateness. Now, if the rotation of the Earth changed speed, this will have some very drastic effects on the crust of the Earth because the oblateness of the Earth is due to the spinning motion of the Earth. And if the Earth slows down, uh, that'll, there has to be an adjustment in the, in the crust of the Earth uh, in the, the reshaping of the new dimensions of oblateness. So we'll come to that a little bit later. And this is one of the factors that we see, I think, is con contributing to earthquakes and will continue to uh, contribute to them until the end of time. The earth, earthquakes themselves in Isaiah uh, 29, verse 6, she shall be visited of Jehovah of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a devouring fire. These are all symbols of judgment. They're used to depict God's judgment. So the whirlwind may be tornadoes, uh, great noise and earthquakes and thunder and tempest. Uh, that would perhaps be such things as uh, tempest in the sea would be uh, tsunamis and things of that nature. Now, earthquakes are linked, can be linked with tsunamis, and for many times they are. Uh, there are two kinds of tsunamis, and the main one is caused by earthquakes, so the uh, moving of uh, material underwater, uh, creating a movement of water, uh, sometimes uh, calving of glaciers can cause small tsunamis in a, in, a, in just a bay area, but uh, those are not the, the main ones we're looking at. In Zechariah 14.5, we see again uh, earthquakes are a symbol of judgment in this, this passage as well. And ye shall flee by the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Zael. Yea, ye shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. And Jehovah my God shall come and all the holy ones with thee. Again, earthquakes are linked with judgment frequently. And so this would not uh, be out of line for earthquakes to have started during the flood and uh, began to occur at that time as symbols and acts of judgment, and they continued this day. Uh, we're still seeing the effects of the sin of the world. Uh, not only did sin was it introduced by Adam and Eve, but the wicked people after that time began to sin more grievously and uh, became so wicked God had to destroy them. In Ezekiel 38, 18 and 19, it shall come to pass in that day that God shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord Jehovah, that my wrath shall come up into my nostrils. For in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I spoken surely in that day there should be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So there's a shaking, which kind of fits in with an earthquake shaking of the earth and that's what happens in an earthquake there are different forces that cause earthquakes and we won't get into all of them but uh, there are forces that cause a shaking of the earth and in ezekiel 38 uh, 20 it'd be our next verse so that the fishes of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field all the creeping things that creep on the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall. Every wall shall fall to the ground. Now that sounds like earthquakes again. We see earthquakes here, as we might find in this passage. Now, the spinning motion of the earth causes the diameter of the earth to be about 28 miles or 42 kilometers greater at the equator than at the polar region. That's a fair amount of distance, 28 miles. Uh, further at the equator. 
than it is at the poles, the poles, the North and South Pole. These differences in the polar and e equatorial diameters of the Earth cause the Earth to be a giant gyroscope. Now, I remember when I was a boy, we got a gyroscope before I actually studied physics, and I, I was really intrigued with them. And uh, I learned later that they used them for guidance and various all kinds of equipment. And uh, so it's a very interesting type device, but it, it holds the Earth upright in a state in a stable position. The spinning motion of does. So it's like a giant gyroscope. The Earth is upright and tilted in the same direction. I remember uh, having this gyroscope and I, I would spin it and then put it on top of a of a little stand and it would just sit there and it would uh, we could tilt it in one location and make it sit. Uh, I was just amazed with it and I didn't understand what was going on. I remember when I was about the fifth or sixth grade at getting one and just and just playing with it. It just amazed me. And uh, I'm a curious person by nature. Okay. The present equatorial radius of the Earth the radius, not the diameter. Of course, the diameter is twice the radius. It's 6,378 kilometers or 3,964 miles. And the polar radius is 6,357 kilometers or 3,950 miles. That's 14 miles difference uh, in those two diameters, the radii. The value of the antediluvian, that is before the flood radius of the Earth is unknown. I don't know what it was. I believe it was uh, the was bigger because I think it spun faster. So the equatorial radius was greater than it is now. Because of the higher speed of uh, rotation. The interaction of the magnetic field of the Earth and the planet that caused the flood would create a torque, but this would be not a great huge torque, but it would create some torque upon the both planets. The magnetic fields would interact, however. The main torque would be due to the gravitational forces that we'll show a little bit later. The torque would not be sufficient to twist both planets extensively on their axes. Other forces will be hypothesized to explain the extensive twisting of the Earth on its axis. I believe the Earth was twisted on its axis. We're going to see evidence of this. The core of the Earth, for example, will show later with scientific proof, it actually spins faster than the rest of the Earth, which is amazing how that could happen and why it could happen and how long it could continue to happen. But the core spins faster than the rest of the Earth. And I believe that the, the planetary flood model that I have explains that that occurrence. We'll get to it later. Here is the sun. If we go to the sun here, those two are the center of the sun to the center of the earth with a straight line that is called the ecliptic plane. Now the planet, I believe it to be Mercury, come in above the ecliptic plane and crossed the earth and it made three passes around. It went across, back around, went across and the sun was pulling it up toward the ecliptic plane. Each time it pulled it further up toward the ecliptic plane. The planet Mercury is not in the ecliptic plane. It's above it. So it, it kind of rotates down like this, much like Pluto, but not quite as pronounced. Now, the, uh, the, the planet Mercury, we'll see other information of this. And we'll look, link this in. Now, as it comes down, it goes through, crosses over, and then rotates around three passes and finally gets pulled away and becomes a, a satellite of the sun. And the Earth just can't capture it. Now, during this time, and I have it in the ecliptic plane here, the rings of it or ice particles would be pulled off toward the Earth. Now, we'll also show something about ice particles as we get into this more fully. There's uh, there's paramagnetic, diamagnetic, and ferromagnetic materials. And we'll talk about all three of those, and we'll show what ice is, and uh, we'll show why this would put the ice particles near the polar regions, not so much in the in the uh, regions like in the around the equator. 
will show why that occurred. Okay. The magnetic field of the Earth is tilted on the axis. Now, what we have here, this is out of a book. I copied it out of a book. And what we have here is this has actually has a uh, it actually has a, an error in it in this diagram. I don't know why the book had this error, but they did. The North Geographic Pole is a South Magnetic Pole. And so that's a mistake. It is a South Magnetic Pole here. And the South Geographic Pole has a North Magnetic Pole. And you can prove that because uh, unlike poles attract, and the North Pole on the compass points toward this pole up here, which has to be a South Pole. But most physics books have it correct. There is a tilt of 11.5 degrees between the geographic pole right now and the magnetic pole. They're off, they're all not lined up with one another. You'd expect them to be lined up, but they're not. And so the magnetic equator goes something like this right here. But again, this book does have those backwards. I just wanted to point that out. I went ahead and just took the book right out of the book. The core of the Earth, uh, they claim, is the center is solid material, and uh, seismic waves uh, travel uh, at different speeds through different densities of material. And so seismic waves will go through here. Now, the pole of the Earth kind of rotates around, and so this rotates, this core fits on this pattern and it rotates around. Now, the solid core is spinning. Remember, we're going to give evidence for it. This core actually spins faster than the mantle and the crust out here. And so this out here is spinning faster. The core gains some speed on the rest of the Earth. So it's actually going faster than the rest of the Earth. Now that can't last for very long because of friction. And so that, that's, a, that's a very interesting uh, phenomena that we see. But my model explains it. The Earth wobbled during the flood. Now, the New American Standard Version, I, to me, it's kind of a Jekyll Hyde translation. And this, uh, what we have, this is the Hebrew word moth, moth. And uh, he established the Earth upon its foundation so that it will not totter forever and ever. So the Earth tottered at some time. There was tottering of the Earth. Now, the, we're going to see how this would occur in my flood model as we develop this. So this is the word for tottering. Thou didst cover it with the deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. We've already talked about this passage. We believe it to be a discussion of the flood. At thy rebuke, they fled. The waters were standing above the mountains. God rebuked them, they fled. At the sound of thy thunder, they hurried away. Mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place which thou didst establish for them. Mountains rose during the flood. The valleys were cut down, cut, the, cut through the, by the erosion. That it set a boundary that the mountain pass over. That means the flood waters won't pass over the land again. They may not return to cover the earth. Now, the word moth, uh, Strong's number H40, Hebrew H4131, uh, is translated shall slide in Deuteronomy 32, 35, be shaken in Psalms 40, Psalm 46, 3, and slippeth in Psalm 94, 18. Notice a, an individual chapter in the book of Psalms is a psalm, and the book is the book of Psalms. So it's not Psalms 23, 20, it's the 23rd Psalm. That's just a kind of a you know, point I want to make. Uh, be aware of that. Uh, vengeance, Deuteronomy 32, uh, 35, is the, one of the passages we noted here, is mine and recompense at the time that thy foot shall slide. So this word is translated to slide, shall slide. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that are to come upon them shall make, make haste. So again, shall slide, that's this Hebrew word. We also have in Psalm 46, 3, Psalm 46, 3, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains tremble, 
So now the word is translated trembling, sliding, slipping, trembling, with the swelling thereof, Selah. Selah probably is at the end of a verse, because the Psalms were the songs that were sung or chanted by the Hebrews or the Jews. When I said, my foot slippeth, again, we have slippeth now, trembling and sliding. Thy loving kindness, O oh God, help me up. So my foot slipped. Here, here's the definition from Brown Driver Briggs, Gisenis, is Hebrew, English, Hebrew, uh, Chaldean, and Hebrew, Hebrew, Chaldean, and English lexicon. Uh, moat, uh, if that's the pronunciation for it. It's to totter, shake, or slip. Remove, retire, deviate from right course, repel, push. Either the all the ways it's translated or it carries those meanings uh, that will fit in. And so the we see this the earth slipping and tottering during the flood. Since the diameter at the equator is 28 miles greater than the diameter at the poles, the outer crust of the earth would have to crack to accommodate the new diameter if that diameter changed. There'd have to be cracks in it. We'll see how that will fit some of the models we have. This would explain the presence of rifts in the Earth's crust as we see rifts occurring. We see Great Rift Valley. This is the African plate, Indian plate, the Arabian plate. There's this Rift Valley coming down through here. This valley going up. So this this is Africa and Saudi Arabia. That's this piece of it here. That this is this right here. We see the plate boundaries. I do believe that there were our plates, and I believe the evidence is pretty clear that plates do exist. Here's the uh, what is called the Gulf of Suez. And this out here is called the Red Sea. This body of water we call the Gulf of Aqaba today. And here's the, where the city of Ezion Geber is, and it was. This is uh, mentioned as in the Bible, Ezion Geber is mentioned as being on the Red Sea, and that would be this body of water. So when they cross the Red Sea, it's not this body here, the Gulf of Suez. I believe it's over here. I think they crossed right in here. That's where they crossed. And they came along the here and were boxed in by the by the. Uh, Egyptians thinking they're going to have an easy victory. And God, of course, opened the waters and they come across and then swallowed up the Egyptians right here. I believe I'm convinced this is probably where it happened. I think this is pretty clear. Mount Sinai is in this region, but we won't go further into that. That's that's outside our study of the flood. Okay. Uh, Saudi, Mount Sinai, according to the scriptures, is in Saudi Arabia in the, the New Testament in the book of Galatians. And this was Saudi Arabia. This was this was part of Egypt and always has been. This was not ever part of Saudi Arabia at any time that we have evidence of. Now, the Great Rift Valley went through here. We can see it occurring. And that Great Rift Valley went through right up through here. And there's your Arabian plate. It went up through here. Okay. Here are the various plates. We won't spend time on these, but I'm, I will try to explain how these plates occurred and why they occurred. All right? Here's the Gulf of Suez, the Red Sea, and uh, these plates. These I didn't through here go through here, and we see the rifts in the crust of the Earth along this uh, uh, area, this zone. These are in kilometers, of course. Here's also another rift area in Mongolia. That's uh, here's Russia and here's China down here. And Mongolia is right in this region. This is Lake Baikal. It's, I believe it's the largest freshwater lake in the world, even larger than Lake Superior. Uh, it even has its own uh, freshwater seals here in Baikal. So it has some interesting life forms there. Here is uh, in Canada, a lake in Canada in a rift zone. And of course, these rifts would be cracks, cracks in the crust of the earth, and that would fill up with water. And that's how these lakes got there. Okay. Here's also a region. This is the state of Texas here and the state of Oklahoma, where I am right now. New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, Utah, and up here into Idaho and 
Oregon. So this uh, this is a region here. Here's a fault line that goes through here. And I believe these would will fit into my model quite well. There's a volcanic belt in here as well. So volcanoes would occur here. Here's Albuquerque, New Mexico, the state of New Mexico in the United States, Utah, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico. There's a rift line through here. Here is your Rio Grande, Rio Grande, we call it the Rio Grande. I think maybe it's frequently pronounced Rio Grande. And that's the Grand River. Uh, so right here. And this just tends to be along a fault line. Cracks in the crust of the earth. The rivers frequently go there. Right here is uh, Missouri, Arkansas. These are states in the United States, Tennessee and uh, Kentucky and Illinois. And this region right in here has a fault line. There was a lake here that was formed. There was a, 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 a an earthquake. I think it was in 1814 where the Mississippi River ran backwards for ran north, filling this, this whole region up with water for like a week. So it, it wasn't running down here. It was running into this. And even right in here was running backwards and running north to fill in that lower region. Some of the water did, so it ran backwards. So the water filled it up and we have this lake here. So this lake goes across. Now, let's look at the shape of the earth and I've got it uh, more, more than what we have. It's just to show the emphasis. It's not this elliptical. So now this what we call eccentricity. That's a ratio of of the uh, this axis to this axis. Uh, if they're the same length, it's, it's the eccentricity is it makes it a circle. And so the the region, this area over here, bulges out further. And if a planet comes near it, it'll pull on this and give a downward force, a vector force downward. So it will tend to rotate it this direction. This planet, this planet that's uh, of, of late, I uh, will will uh, rotate downward, and so the forces on the Earth would tilt it and rotate it, and of course, if we pull this down, this would go up like this. The gravity of this planet here would pull down on it, so that would create a downward force. The planet made three or four passes, probably three and a half around the Earth, it would shift the Earth on its axis to a new axis each pass that it made. And whenever it crossed over the Earth, it would it would pull it. It would pull the crust of the Earth in different directions due to the gravity uh, being forced being going in different directions. Notice here, let me go back. We take the gravity we usually go to make this calculation simple. We go from the center of this to the center of this over here, but when we're looking at it, we can take this force here, pulls downward this direction on this object here, and it'll pull in on this object over here with a lesser force because it's a greater distance. So it pulls in this region. Now, if the planet moves around, it's pulling different parts of it in different directions. So each part then would move in a different direction. So these these plates that were cracked up, cracks that occurred due to the change in the diameter of the Earth, uh, due to the slowing down of the motion of it. And uh, when that happens in the cracks, these would form what we call plates. It would get back to your plates. Let's go back and look at them. These plates then would each move in different directions as the planet pulled on them in, in different points. The planet, let's say, is over here and it would pull directly on these, but it would pull in this direction on this one, this direction on this one, this direction on this one, if the planet's in here. If the planet moved over here, then it would pull this in this direction, and each one would be pulled in a different direction. The composite forces that were all acting upon it at different times would move it in different directions. And that's what we see here. These plates then can move in different directions as you see them moving here. As you see the arrows showing the way that the plates are moving, and they can move in different directions due to the forces as the planet moved around the Earth. Now, back over here now. 
I believe the planet made three and a half passes uh, around the Earth and shift the Earth on, on its axis to a new axis each time. Now what happens is you can see this uh, with a, an ice skater that's rotating. That ice skater, as they move their arms out, they'll slow down. As they move their arms in, they'll speed up. And that's conservation of angular momentum, it's called. And create the plates and sections on the Earth's crust, which are moved to the spinning motion of the Earth. And the spinning motion, as the two planets interacted, they would exchange angular momentum. And it would speed up uh, the Mercury and slow down the Earth, depending on which way they're rotating. If the Earth rotated or twisted on its axis each time the planet passed the Earth, these plates would move in different directions. So we'd have our plates moving in different directions as it passed around. The magnetic field of the, of the Earth looks kind of like this, South Pole on the top and North Pole on the bottom. That's what it looks like. It is tilted on the axis. Of the magnetic poles, it's widely known that the magnetic field of the Earth has been moving since the time it was first measured. That's a, that is a given. There's it's been measured for quite some time. Uh, Incrinez, Bibring, and Blanc uh, state on page 137 of their book, slow variation with time has been established with a magnetic inclination. Inclination is the, the, the way it's tilted which drifts toward the west at about 0.5 degrees per year. So it's it's moving toward the west that uh, Earth's magnetic field is. <clears throat> Here's another source. The Earth's magnetic field is not a static affair. Static is a word that is used in science to mean something that's stationary. If it's static, it doesn't move. We think of the word status quo, it stays the same. And as early as 1634, it was noticed that at a fixed place, the direction of a compass needle changes slowly with time. At London, for example, a compass needle pointed 11 degrees east of true north in 1580. The direction changed gradually to 24 degrees west of due north in, by, in 1812. So that's, uh, that's nearly 300 years, 200, uh, close to about uh, 230 or 40 years. At the present time, a compass points nine degrees west of north. So notice how it's changed. 11 degrees east of north, 24 west, nine degrees west now of north. So they, they've been measuring it for that all that period of time. Uh, this uh, this is not me. This is his given name is Marion. Thus the Earth's magnetic pole wanders slowly with respect to the geographic pole. Now. That would fit if, mm -hmm. uh, if we see some other information that we're going to look at. Okay. This is Marion, a man named Jerry B. Marion, Physics in the Modern World. This is the site of the book. Now, notice here your geographic and magnetic poles are not lined up with one another. So they're, they're offset a bit. Now, that's, that's interesting as to why that would be the case. But we do see this movement. So we can see the movement. If the poles are associated with the core, then they would move around and following the rotation of the core. And remember, the core rotates faster than the rest of the Earth. We'll show that later. That is an amazing thing, and that would uh, complicate matters as well. Here's a map that I, I took out of a, of a source, and this shows where the magnetic pole head was in 2001. And uh, this is in Canada, up in here. And the magnetic pole, 1831, was here. And, and uh, 1904, I don't know if they've measured it all this time, it's moved. And the magnetic pole has been moving. <coughs> and the uh, federal government, <coughs> Federal Aviation Agency, <coughs> has, has their, their compasses lined up and their runways are numbered by their how they're oriented toward the magnetic field of the Earth, North Pole. And so they're lined up for magnetic compasses and also with true north. And so the, they have to have a, a correction on their compasses from time to time. As this pole moves, uh, pilots have to 
reca recalibrate their compasses. They have to be recalibrated. Now here's what they've observed. This was what we had observed in the past right here. And now they, they have modeled with other information. They say it was right over here at 1600. 1700, it's moved down, so it has been moving around. And that would fit, if you look here, this is uh, in this region right in here. There's the geographic North Pole up here. And this region right here is the wedge that we have right here. Go back a minute. Notice that uh, this pole, this is moving around. And so we are going to go back and see. It appears to be moving around and around some, some manner. Now, paleomagnetism, magnetic data. Now, paleo is the Greek word for old. Paleomagnetic data have also shown that the movement of individual lithospheric, lithos is the Greek word for rock or stone, lithospheric plates may also be considered in any interpretation of polar boundaries. And so we must also consider that. Thousands of pole positions have been calculated from specimens collected throughout the world. Now, what he's doing is he's looking at the magnetism in rocks. That's what he's talking about. It is known that for any specific time, the location of the poles was given by specimens from one continent and be different from the location supplied by specimens from another continent. And again, we ask how they dated the rocks in the first place, probably by fossils that they're in them and uniformitarian techniques most likely, which we talked about earlier. <clears throat> this is considered to be evidence for large scale movements of individual continents. The rocks with these continent contain magnetic orientation have been shifted so that they no longer point where they originally did. Most of the data can be reconciled by shifting the continents backwards along certain paths until they occupy the position they did at the time of magnetization. So they shift the continents back. That's one, one way they I claim that the continents have moved. Right. When this is done, it becomes evident that there must have been both slippage of the entire lithosphere and movement of individual plates. Exactly what we're claiming happened during the flood. This is Stokes. Okay. Now, the problem with Stokes' claims, his claim when you go back and read it, is that he assumes that uniformitarianism is true. But we've already shown that the modern ge geologists have rejected uniformitarianism. But yet they, when they go back to explain these things, they revert back to uniformitarianism, which they have already rejected. So again, uh, they can't get away from uniformitarianism because their models demand it because they got to have the time. They won't allow for something like a flood to have occurred. So their model rules out the possibility of catastrophes, yet they have accepted catastrophism as the norm, actually, and they reject uniformitarianism. But then they revert back to uniformitarianism because they have to have it to get this time back in. So that's a problem with their whole system. Uh, they can't be consistent. And uh, they've used linear extrapolation. Now, extrapolation is what we project beyond the data. For instance, we can say the stock market has been going up at a certain rate, and uh, we're going to project that it'll continue to go up at that rate. Of course, there could be other things to happen. Catastrophes could occur. Say. So again, what we have here is they've used linear extrapolation, projecting the data that they have beyond what they what actually information they have. Project backwards, they projected backwards and forwards in time to determine when these plates moved apart. And they've used linear extrapolation, which means uniformitarianism. Right? And that's a problem with their whole system. Any correlation of the movement or apparent movement of the magnetic poles with the movement of the geographic poles of the Earth must explain so the Bailey Field has moved extensively since 1630 without the geographic pole wandering. So there's a problem there. The magnetic pole has moved, but the geographic pole has not. That's, that's another problem we run into. 
the shifting of the earth on its axis would help to explain how certain some mountain ranges were elevated as well. The upward force exerted on the land masses acting in conjunction with tides in the crust of the earth would shift them about the surface of the earth. When they're forced against one another, another land mass, they would elevate mountain ranges. The Himalaya mountains are thought to have been raised by that method. <laughs> this is called foliation here. Geologists refer to this as foliation. And so we get, let me just watch my mouse. We get a region pushing against another region, and they're both moving in this direction, and they butt together, they'll go up when they come together, coming this way, another one coming this way, and they hit each other, and they'll kind of lift up. I can't show it right here, but we do have some slides that will show foliation later. <clears throat> we have what we call isostasy. And uh, Shepman, Wilson, and Todd in their book. This is a pretty good uh, general science book. It's pretty easy to read. The concept that a condition of equilibrium, the equilibrium is everything's at the same force, is present in Earth's crust so that all rock masses are in balance. So they're, they're all balanced. And we'll talk about this. That's what the isostasy is. Now, this is ESOS is the Greek word same, S-A-M-E. And stasis is to stand. They stand in the same force or the same level. An object can be placed into a liquid and will float if its density is less than the density of the liquid. Now we see this as another principle of science. So if you take a piece of wood, It'll, it'll, most wood will float. Now, there's some wood that's more dense than water and it'll sink. Iron wood is one of these, and there's a wood in Oklahoma that Indians made bows out of called Boys Boat Art or Osage Orange. Uh, it, it is almost dense enough to sink in the water. Here's Blaise Pascal. He's a scientist, and that's a picture of him. We have an equation that Pascal Locke's law gave us this. This is going to help us to explain what went on during the flood. Shows that an increase in surface pressure, P sub O, results in the same pressure in increase throughout the fluid if the fluid is confined. More generally, a pressure increase anywhere in the fluid is felt throughout the fluid, a fact first recognized by Pascal and now known as Pascal's law. Next slide. Pascal applied this principle in his invention to the, of the hydraulic press. Today, hydraulic systems based on Pascal's law are used to control machinery, range from automobile brake systems to aircraft wings to bulldozers, cranes, and robots. And this is a, a, a University of Physics, General Physics book, Wilson and Pascal. And I go back to this now. Here's your equation in, in this book. P equals P sub O plus RGH, where R is the density of the fluid, G is the acceleration of gravity, and H is the distance the fluid is depressed. We'll come over here and look at it right here. If we put one pound of weight right here on this area, one square inch, and it moves it 10 inches down, then this will move this 10 square inch area one inch up. So it'll actually, this could actually move it moves down, it can move this up over here. So this is a principle by which we take a hydraulic jack and jack an object up. So again, again we see Pascal's law apparatus, 100 pounds of force and uh, one square inch, 100 PSI. 100 PSI can lift this 500 pound weight up. This moves 10 inches down and this moves this five, uh, 500 pound weight up. Uh, five uh, square inches and moves it two inches up. So we, we get a conservation of energy, but uh, it does move it up. That's how a hydraulic jack works right there. That's how it works. That's your basic principle. I've used those all the time as a boy and I never understood them. I was using them when I was um, in elementary school. I'd get a jack and we'd jack things up and, and I remember using them. My dad had had me run and get one. I was a gopher. I had three older brothers. I'd run to get the jack, and then I sometimes would have to jack things up. 
and the uh, jack up and lift a big heavy weight with it. Prior to the flood, there was no rain, no ice, no ice caps, no extensive erosion to change the isostasis of the earth. And the living earth was in perfect or near perfect isostasis. So, since the flood, however, erosion and the melting of the ice caps are constantly changing the isostasis of the earth which causes both earthquakes and volcanoes. Now we'll see how that occurs, but what we do here is, let's go back and I kind of give you a, kind of a model of it. If ice melts over here, like 10 inches of ice melts, then that can lift this area over here, two inches up, 100 pounds of ice melting, and lift up over here to this confined region, that is this fluid, like the magma of the earth in the fluid, you can force, put a force over here and lift this up. So this can go down and this can lift up. So again, Pascal's law can do it. And added, this would be added weight over here to it. But if we took the weight off so that this elevated, this would come down. So this, they move in opposite directions. So what happened? Now, Earthquakes and volcanoes release the energy and tend to keep the Earth near a state of isostasis. So it releases that energy, earthquakes and volcanoes do. Peltier has an extensive discussion of how melting ice caps affect the isostasis of the Earth, pages 195 to 201. It's reasonable to attribute volcanoes to the physical changes wrought by the flood as well, because the water coming out of the oceans cover the land would depress the continents and lower them into the magma. You know, that would put, uh, if you had water coming out and covering the North American continent, the North American continent would depress into the magma and it would move those forces all the way around the earth, creating upward forces everywhere along the whole earth, uh, the, everywhere where the water wasn't covering the land. And then as the water moved around, it would these forces would change and they would move the earth and uh, move it up and down. This would form cracks in the crust. This would be your plates that we've seen. And then the planet that was causing the flood would be interacting with the crust and uplifting it due to gravitational forces. And, and these forces would act on the plates in different directions, moving them in different directions. So this would, I believe, explain what we see here. Second Peter 3, 5 says, Peter's discussion of the flood, he says, for this they willfully forget, they don't want to know it, they don't want to remember it, that there were heavens of old and earth compacted out of water to mist water by the word of God, by which means the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So there's an overflowing of the water. Peter states that the Diluvian world, cosmos, uh, pronounced cosmos or cosmos, perished. That doesn't mean the land perished, it means the people of the world perished. The land surfaces continue to rise. Uh, the earth hasn't reached isostasis even today. The land surfaces, because the magma is, is what, what you think of it as a liquid, it's, it's very, uh, it takes a long time to move this liquid due to uh, forces of, of uh, momentum forces. The land surfaces continue to rise even today. For example, the Baltic Sea is still rising about one meter or three feet per century at its northern end and more slowly in the south to the south, but in time be lifted almost entirely above sea level. This is Shipman, Wilson, and Todd, page 691. They measure, they can measure this lift uh, due to with satellites. Stokes writes, observation and theoretical considerations have convinced geologists that the crust of the earth sinks when it accumulates a sufficiently heavy burden of sediment, water, and or ice. That it rises when such loads are removed. That makes perfectly good sense. That's perfectly good physics. The sinking of the overloaded area, they believe, is compensated for, for at deeper levels in the crust by an outflowing of plastic material. This condition of balance is known as isostasis of great fundamental importance of shaping the surface. The outflowing of plastic material would be the various kinds of volcanoes or movement of crust at least. 
K and Colbert state and studies of present precisely determined elevation indicate that the southern end of Hudson's Bay is still rising relatively to the Great Lakes. Relative to the Great Lakes. So it's rising. The, the inevitable conclusion is that either the land happened to subside in the region it was being by that was being glaciated and to rise thereafter, or that the glacial ice placed a load on the crust that produced isostatic adjustment. Subsist subsidence during glaciation followed by elevation after glaciation. It doesn't immediately rebound. It takes some time to move all that mass. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing it being re rebounding right now after the as the glaciers have melted. The movement of large quantities of water over the land would add a, a large amount of weight to the land masses, causing them to sink into the magma as well. At the same time, the removal of this water from the ocean would cause the ocean floors to tend to rise as the forces pushing upward were greater than the downward force of the water pressure. Again, we would have the ocean floors rising and the continent sinking. All of this uh, creating all kinds of volcanic action. Well, now, this is our last slide for tonight. Do you have any questions? Anybody? Right. There it is. I'm going to go ahead and. <clears throat> 